All right, so hopefully you're all here because uh, your Kubernetes clusters are ridiculously insecure. Um, and I'm going to try and help you to fix that right in the next hour. So first thing I want to introduce myself. My name is Steve Wade. I'm uh, director of engineering at a company called KSOC Labs. We do Kubernetes security. Uh, I've contributed to a number of upstream projects. Maybe some of these you've heard of. Maybe some of these you haven't. Uh, I was running Kubernetes in production at 1.2. Uh, for any of you who are familiar with a release that old, deployments weren't a thing at that point. Uh, Jimmy beats me. He actually was running it at 0 0.8. Jimmy's my boss. Um, I actually played professional football until I was 18. Um, and then I had a bad injury, and now I'm up here doing this. Uh, and I blog a lot about the things that we're currently working on from a security standpoint, but also from a, a platform engineering and uh, you know, uh, self-service delivery to developers. So I want to start with a question. How secure is your Kubernetes cluster? <laughs> You're going with average. Good, good. All right. Most people say this. Nothing to see here. Move along. You know, who cares about security? Uh, you know, my application developers can deploy 20, 100 times a day, but they forget all of this other major ecosystem with inside Kubernetes. So we're here to talk about OWASP and Kubernetes. And you know, there's a collaboration, an effort that's been going on between OWASP and Kubernetes now for just under a year. There's some links here. The top one is the actual uh, top 10 for Kubernetes that we're going to spend most of our time talking about. But there's also others here from a Docker perspective, a nice cheat sheet there, and also a Kubernetes security cheat sheet as well. This is the beautiful repository on the OWASP organization on GitHub that contains the top 10. And what we're going to do today is we're going to digest that top 10 and go into them in a bit more detail. So yes, unfortunately, it's, it's another top 10. Uh, there's many of these top 10s around. However, Kubernetes now is starting to become very mature. Right? There's a lot of companies running it. And if you were here earlier to uh, hear Jimmy's talk about uh, untangling RBAC, you'll notice and remember he was saying, you know, they were running Kubernetes in rocks, right, to, to um, s review and look at weather conditions, but also to, uh, to hear what other people are saying in the desert. Another interesting example is a company called Chick-fil-A. I don't know, hands up if you're familiar with Chick-fil-A. It's an, it's an American chicken shop. I'm probably saying that incorrectly, and Jimmy's going to kill me. Um, but essentially, they run Kubernetes in every single one of their stores. Right? So they have a little miniature cluster that they run. And they, half of their restaurant functions from messages flowing in and out of this Kubernetes, uh, this local Kubernetes cluster. So Kubernetes is everywhere. right? But it's such a complex ecosystem that people focus on the ability and ease to be able to deploy their applications. Right? That's why Kubernetes is so successful. It makes it easy for you to be able to deploy applications into your Kubernetes cluster and scale them quickly and easily. But you know, that at scale, there are a lot of security concerns and things to consider. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So here is the beautiful top 10 uh, OWASP for Kubernetes. So all the way starting at the top with workload configurations and kind of ending at the bottom at, yes, some of the Kubernetes components may be insecure. And we'll get into that as well. Don't just trust everything you know, that you pull off the internet. So we're going to start with insecure workload configurations. And unfortunately, there is some YAML in this talk. I apologize. Uh, but that's just the world we live in with Kubernetes. Everything's YAML, right? Everyone becomes a YAML engineer. So I'm going to start with this quote. Misconfigurations top the chart when it comes to security issues. In 2021, the Kubernetes security survey from uh, Red Hat stated that 60% of residents have experienced a misconfiguration incident in their Kubernetes cluster in the last 12 months. 60% of a lot of people that are running Kubernetes, probably a pretty big problem, right? The reason why it's number one. So if anyone is familiar with the Kubernetes templating language and YAML in general, you end up with manifest files that could be 100, 150, 200. If you're running Istio, that number goes to about 10,000 uh, lines of YAML. And it's extremely easy to miss the key parts of the YAML manifest because you're so focused on the bit that's very specific to your application. So how can we prevent it? Well, there are a number of sections within a Kubernetes manifest 
where we can start to secure things. So the prime example here is that we have a block called the security context. This is the context that everyone forgets about. And if you're in the training that uh, Jimmy and I did for the last two days, we spent quite a lot of time talking about this security context. So the kind of things that we can do is we can make sure that you're not running as root. So you know, running as root pretty bad, and we'll get into the reasons for that later. Uh, we can also make sure that we have a read-only root file system, right? We don't want, if I manage to get inside your pod, you know, if I can start to pull binaries down to the root file system, you know, I can start to run them. I could be doing anything. I could be Bitcoin mining, uh, or I could be making random requests to, uh, to erroneous websites. And there are a number of other security contexts that are available to you that stop you from having insecure Docker containers or images and running them in an insecure way in your Kubernetes cluster, right? And the way I talk about Kubernetes is it kind of blends and forces developers and operators to have to talk to each other, right? So the developer is responsible for their image, and maybe or maybe not, the developer is not responsible for the configuration of their Kubernetes cluster or their manifest that they're currently deploying to Kubernetes. And this is where we can start to set some standards, right? So in a previous life, I spent a lot of time uh, working as a platform engineer, building self-service tooling for developers, this security context kind of becomes a contract between you and the application team. So I'm, we're going to set some standards. We're going to allow you to be able to do certain things. And essentially, if you do not conform to them, we're not going to allow you in. Right? Security context is key to be able to do that. So what tools do we have to offer? Right? Because that's a, that's a load of YAML. There's a load of different key value pairs that I have to try and remember and figure out. So there's a tool uh, called OPA Gatekeeper. Hands up if you're familiar with the term OPA Gatekeeper. OK, a number of you. So its job is to stop bad things getting into your Kubernetes cluster. And the way you do that is you enforce policy. So we say, if a deployment enters into the Kubernetes cluster, so the request here is coming from somebody on their laptop. The first thing that it touches is the API server. And there is where we start to enforce policy. So we can say things such as, are you running as root? If you are, and you, you're still running as root in your Kubernetes manifest, reject the deployment. Or specify the user and group that you want to run with inside your, um, your pod. If that's not set, or it's set too high, or it's not set to the one that you, you want it to be set to, then also reject that deployment as well. Right? So this kind of becomes the gatekeeper, hence the term, uh, for entry into the Kubernetes cluster. Right? And at scale, when you're dealing with potentially hundreds, maybe thousands of different product teams, this is the way that we can start to enforce standards in our Kubernetes cluster. Right? If we allow everybody to go rogue and developers to be deploying uh, applications that are having um, completely different configurations, we start to get inconsistency. When we get inconsistency, we start to get problems. So this is just a tool that is available to you at your disposal for you to start to set some standards. Next one, number two, is supply chain vulnerabilities. So a single container, as I put here, you know, has hundreds of different third-party components. And we pull images off the internet. right? Everyone, everyone's done that before. I've done it hundreds of times. And we just assume they're secure. right? And even ones that I pull from my own registry, or a registry that I think is um, you know, secure, it may not be. So as an example, the first five to 10 most pulled Docker images on Docker Hub, they all have CVEs, right, as an example. So we need a way of being able to make sure that the things that we're running inside our Kubernetes cluster are actually validated somehow. right? We don't want CVEs entering our system. We also want to make sure that where we're pulling those images from are actually the images that we created. right? So. Just because I uploaded an image to my registry and I tagged it as 1.2.3 doesn't mean a week later that 1.2.3 is the image that I created, right? Because those tags are uh, ephemeral. I can, I can uh, upload a, a new image with exactly the same tag and overwrite the previous one. So the next person pulls the image down. They're running a Bitcoin miner rather than running my application. So what can we do to prevent this? We can perform a software bill of materials. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes in 2022 and 2023, this is the biggest buzzword going in supply chain security in Kubernetes. So an SBOM essentially defines 
uh, a file that states all of the components that make up your build, hence the term bill of materials. You can also sign your images. So we can sign them, upload them to the registry with a signature, and then when we pull them down, we can validate that signature, therefore knowing that what I actually uploaded to the registry is what I expect when I pull the, when I pull the image down. Image composition. So hands up if you're uh, currently running Docker in production in some form. OK, keep your hands up if you're using an image such as Ubuntu as your base image, or uh, Debian, or CentOS. Okay, so have you seen how many vulnerabilities those have just on their own? Right, there's a load of vulnerabilities. D do you truly need a CentOS operating system to be able to run your binary? Probably not. Small web server now inside my, inside my pod. I get inside my pod, I have a fully fledged web server, I can just go crazy, right? I've got curl, I've got wget, I've got everything by default. So when we talk about image composition, I talk about the term just enough. Just enough for my image to be able to run and nothing else. Right? Do I need curl inside my application that is currently an API server? No, I probably don't. Does a hacker? Yes, he does, or yes, she does. So some operating systems or some images that I'd recommend. If you're running a statically compiled binary, Scratch. Right? Scratch is basically absolutely nothing. Right? You can't do anything apart from run your application. Or there's uh, images such as uh, Distrolis. Distrolis is a much uh, smaller uh, Linux distribution that has, again, the absolute bare minimum. Sometimes those base images are not going to work in your, in your instance because you require packages that can't run on these types of images. So my starting point in that instance would be something like Alpine. Right? Alpine is extremely small. Alpine, for example, out the box doesn't come with curl. It does come with wget, which is you know, questionable, but at least it doesn't come with curl. So I would start. At, I would start smaller and then go larger. So I'd start with Scratch. If Scratch doesn't work for my, you know, my application, I'd move to Distrolist. If Distrolist doesn't work for my application, I'd go to Alpine. For the stuff that we're currently doing at KSOC, we're heavy users of of Kafka. Kafka needs uh, libRD Kafka, which is a, a C binary. So it kind of it it already takes out Scratch and Distrolist, and we have to be we're forced to use Alpine, right? And then we then we embed the the package that we require. OK, so for, you, for those of you who are using Docker, how many of you are scanning your images? OK, how many of you have a policy to make sure that that image can't get into production if it doesn't conform to some kind of standard? All the hands go down. So what we need to make sure of is that we don't just do this as a tick box exercise. right? We actually use it. And that's where policy enforcement comes in. So we can say, OK, on the entry door to Kubernetes, can you make sure that this image doesn't have any critical CVEs? And if it does, kick it back. Right? So Gatekeeper and this uh, open policy agent starts to become a really powerful mechanism for us to be able to stop bad configuration or bad images from making their way into Kubernetes. Overly permissive RBAC configuration. So for anyone that wasn't here this morning when Jimmy gave his talk about overly permissive RBAC permissions, um, RBAC is a way that we can uh, create and allow for fine-grained access to your Kubernetes cluster, right? So we can say, allow Steve to have access to the development namespace and allow someone else to have access to the production namespace, right? No one ever trusts me to do anything in production. Um, however, the RBAC ecosystem is so vast and it can become extremely difficult to be able to work out who has access to what, who needs access to what, and thirdly, what one of my components that I'm currently running in my cluster, what access does it need? Right? People forget that there's also workloads that are inside Kubernetes. They can also have access to the Kubernetes API. It's not just humans. Right? There's the difference between humans and service accounts. Service accounts are workloads that you're currently running within Kubernetes that, are, that need access to the API server. So a prime example is a tool like a GitOps tool who is syncing the contents of the uh, cluster from a Git repository into Kubernetes and is then responsible for deploying it. 
it needs to know what's currently running in order to be able to make the decision of what it needs to apply to the Kubernetes cluster. So here is an example. There are, there's uh, four main kinds within the RBAC configuration inside Kubernetes. You've got role and cluster role. Cluster role is scoped at the cluster. Role is scoped at a namespace, and we'll come on to namespaces shortly. And a role binding and a cluster role binding. And a, a binding binds uh, a user. That user could be a human, could be a group, or it can also be a service account. And it binds it to a cluster role or role. Essentially, what permissions does this have? This block here is the first dangerous block. So cluster admin is one of the default cluster roles that is installed into the Kubernetes cluster. And it provides you with what I call the five-star review. Right? The five-star review is not the review you actually want. You actually want something like a one-star review in this instance. What do I mean by five-star review? I mean. Every API, every API version, every kind, every verb, uh, every non-resource, and every URL. So essentially, absolutely everything. When you create a namespace inside of Kubernetes, you get a default service account. The default service account is added to every single workload within your Kubernetes cluster in that namespace if you don't specify a different service account. So every workload that we currently deploy using this configuration to the default namespace gets complete cluster admin. So if I can get into one of your pods, I can install kubectl, which is a binary that allows us to be able to inter interact with the Kubernetes cluster. I can essentially do anything. List all your secrets, start deploying random workloads, start deploying random jobs. We don't want to be doing this. This is, again, taken from Jimmy's talk. It essentially is saying that when I uh, allow you to be able to list secrets. If I get inside of a pod that is currently running in Kubernetes and I do a curl request, the curl request at the bottom, you don't just get to list the secret as in like this is the secret name. You actually get the whole entire contents of the secret as well. So be careful when you use the word list and watch. In, in a curl instance, it gives you much more data than you would expect. Right? Config maps also does the same thing. You can get the data out of them. So how do we prevent it? So we should prevent direct access uh, from end users as much as possible. Right? If we can limit the scope of who has access to the Kubernetes cluster, it's going to make our life much, much easier. Right? Sometimes this is not possible, but with tools such as uh, GitOps, you don't need to be able to allow some kind of centralized CI CD system access to your Kubernetes cluster. That thing will definitely need a five-star review, because you don't know what you're going to be deploying. Don't use service accounts outside of the cluster. So people do this regularly. Uh, they never get rotated. right? They just live forever and work forever. So once you've got that service account token, you're good to go. Right? You can do whatever you want. Third one is avoid auto-mounting that default service account token that we currently just talked about. One accidental slip there, every single pod in your namespace you know, has terrible access. Fourth one down. Audit RBAC. So Kubernetes is really uh, verbose in the way it uh, presents audit logs from your Kubernetes cluster. You can leverage those logs, and not a lot of people actually leverage them, to be able to tell you what is going on in your Kubernetes cluster and what people actually use, not what people think they need to use. Right? So as a prime example, one of the things that I'd recommend you start doing is locking down your RBAC and having annoying conversations with developers because they want more RBAC. And then there's a little collaboration between the two of you, and then you agree on probably something in the middle. And then you can figure their RBAC like that, right? rather than just giving them everything and then finding out they only use a small slither of it. And finally, to use role bindings rather than cluster role bindings. right? Cluster role bindings can be really dangerous. I don't need to be able to see like seven other product teams' namespaces and be able to interact with them. I only care about the one that I'm currently running in. Lack of centralized policy enforcement. So we kind of talked about this before, but now what we were talking about previously was one cluster. Now imagine like 10 or 15 or 20 clusters. Right? How do we make sure that we've got consistency in what's getting deployed to those 20 clusters? The team that's responsible for managing Kubernetes may be relatively small in comparison to the number of developers that you currently have in your organization. 
So we need a way of being able to firstly detect there's a problem, and secondly, remediate that problem right, as quickly as we possibly can. Consistency is key when it comes to Kubernetes, and we're going to get onto that um, at the end. And there are ways to be able to start to drive consistency. A prime example. So let's imagine we have all the policies that we've added to Gatekeeper, and we don't allow people to run images that are off the internet. We make sure that they have good security context. Um, with this single command here that I think it's leaked because it fits in a tweet, which is just incredible, um, you are essentially running a pod in the Kubernetes cluster. So that's the first line. Adding a set of overrides. So uh, host PID true basically means now I've got access to the PIDs that are currently running on the underlying host. I run an Alpine container. I then mount mount. I switch the namespace, and now I've essentially done a total container breakout from a pod that is running in my Kubernetes cluster. And see where it says restart never? As soon as, as, soon as uh, Duffy exited that pod, you'd never see it again. Right, so they can, it runs for the life cycle of the time that pod's up. He could do whatever he wanted. He removes that. We can no longer see it. Right? It's, kind of, it's blind to us. So a number of tools that we can use to prevent this at scale. We kind of touched a little bit on Open Policy Agent with, with Gatekeeper, but there are others available to us. You can use Kubewarden or Caverno. They're essentially doing the same kind of thing. They're enforcing policies at the API level. That's what they're responsible for. Inadequate logging and monitoring. So Kubernetes, like as a system, logs a lot, right? But so do your applications. So do things that are communicating with Kubernetes. Kubernetes works on an event stream. There's thousands and thousands of events that are going on like all the time within Kubernetes. Kubernetes is basically just a giant reconcile loop that continuously works. But we don't use the logs enough, or we don't store them in a centralized location in order for us to really, truly understand what's going on. So. What can we do to prevent this, right? We can start reviewing the Kubernetes audit logs like we were talking about before. Like, you know, Jane is trying to access a secret and keeps getting denied. Well, if Jane constantly keeps trying to access a secret from an IP address that you don't, you don't recognize, it's probably not a great thing. Or Jenkins is currently trying to you know, list all of the secrets in name any random namespace uh, from the outside world from a publicly accessible IP address. Well, if Jenkins is running inside your cluster and the IP address is outside your cluster, someone's trying to get in from the outside, right? It's so rich, the Kubernetes audit logs. If you're not looking at them, you're really losing a lot of context about what's going on in your Kubernetes cluster. Now we've got those logs. We kind of need to centralize all of the logs together. So we've got kind of event logs. We've got the logs that are coming from your container or application. We've got cloud logs, like who's accessing what with CloudTrail or CloudWatch, um, you know, who's accessing your load balancer, et cetera, et cetera, or like traces that are going all the way through your system. Right? And once we collate these all together, it allows us to be able to tell a good overall holistic picture of what on earth's going on. Right? There's thousands, hundreds or thousands of workloads potentially that are running in your Kubernetes cluster, and you need to try and plot the story of what's going on. The other thing that people seem to miss as well is this runtime detection piece. So using tools such as Falco, which essentially is a way of us being able to say, OK, what process is currently running? You know, what is that process trying to do? And if you remember, if I go back you know, a couple of slides when I was talking about setting standardized user IDs and group IDs, I could write a rule in Falco that says, if I have any process in this namespace, that's not running as this user and this group, why? Like, what's going on? Like, put my attention there, right? With, in a Kubernetes cluster that has loads and loads going on, I don't want noise, right? And this is where standardization tries to, starts to come in. If we don't standardize at the lowest level, we're going to make our lives much, much easier on a, ma on, a, on a bigger scale. Broken authentication. So, there are a number of different ways that you can authenticate with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is essentially bring your own authentication mechanism. You, you can't kubectl get users. You can't kubectl get pods. 
How you get users into the system is totally up to you. And once they're there, you can use RBAC to be able to you know, set those permissions. Well, that's really bright. Um, so here is the flow, as if you were a human or a service account that we talked to before, the flow in which your request goes until it gets stored in etcd. So etcd is a kind of database. Everything gets stored there. And then the reconcile loop happens from that perspective. So there's a number of gates that we currently have. We've been talking kind of at the third gate there about admission control with Gatekeeper and Caverno and stuff like that. What we're talking about now is authentication and authorization. Those are the first two gates that you're going to go through before you get to the policy or the admission control. So what can we do to make sure that you know, we, we don't cause ourselves a problem when it comes to authentication? So number one for me personally is to avoid certificates. Certificates are like, difficult to rotate right, quickly if, if we get you know, if we get hacked or somebody starts to own the Kubernetes cluster, or even worse than that, someone commits their cube config to Git. I have actually seen that before. And you have a publicly accessible Kubernetes cluster. This is like game over, right? I have to rotate the whole entire Kubernetes cluster and all the certificates, or I have to delete the cluster and bring it all the way back up. Both of those are not great in that instance. And the time it takes could potentially be unknown. Force MFA wherever possible. You know, that's just a good practice that we should be doing anyway. Just because we do it when we log into websites doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it when we're accessing you know, Kubernetes. If I haven't said this enough, don't use service accounts outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Those tokens last forever. Once I have them, I can do whatever I want. The standard should be to use short-lived tokens that allow us to be able to validate whether that person should have access to the Kubernetes cluster. As I said before, the way that you bring users into the system is plug and play. You can choose your OIDC adventure, essentially. Plug that into your Kubernetes cluster. Choose the part of the JWT that you care about to use as your user or group. Once you've defined that user and group, you can then configure your RBAC uh, setup with inside your Kubernetes cluster. Missing network segmentation. So we've kind of talked about ways that we can configure the Kubernetes cluster and configure all these YAML files. All right, but what about like, can application A talk to application B? Right? Namespaces by themselves are not isolation boundaries. Right? They're just not. People think of them as vertical columns that have tiny little holes in them. I call them a sponge. Right? Any namespace can talk to any other namespace by default. People end up putting dev staging and production in different namespaces. Unfortunately, if you go to the Kubernetes documentation, they actually say that's a good idea, uh, which is unbelievable. Without this network segmentation, any pod has the ability to be able to talk to any other pod. So as a hacker, once I'm inside your pod, all I'm going to do is start scanning all of the Kubernetes cluster for all of your other services. Once I have all of your other services, you know, I might find a, you know, I might find a Redis service, for example. Probably because it's running in Kubernetes and someone's lazy, that's not going to be authenticated. And now I start to just suck data out of the Kubernetes cluster from the inside. So prime example here is exactly what I just said. So WordPress get, pod gets compromised. You start to scan for ports on the, you know, that are open inside of Kubernetes. You find you know, 6379. You notice it's Redis. You start running curl requests because you're running, you know, you're running Ubuntu as an example, and you've got curl installed. Data can start to be stolen, get modified, put on the dark web, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how do we prevent this? So, the first most obvious one is to use multiple different clusters. Have a dev cluster, have a staging cluster, have a production cluster. Yes, it's a little bit of overhead, but it allows us to have cluster boundaries. Right? And this is what I was talking about before with making sure that we've got consistency. All those policies that are running in staging and, and, and development should also be running in production. Right? Standardization is key. Um, we can use uh, resources with inside Kubernetes that allow us to truly make namespaces uh, an isolation boundary. And the way we do that is with network policies. So unfortunately, yes, it's a bit more YAML. Um, that you have to configure. But you know, you're all going to become YAML engineers if you start to leverage Kubernetes. And then the final one 
uh, is a service mesh. Hands up if you're familiar with the term service mesh. Hands up if you're using a service mesh. Hands up if you're using a service mesh in production. Iffy, OK. Uh, so there are a number of different ways that we can uh, allow and deny certain workloads from being able to talk to each other. So as an example here on the left-hand side, we have a network policy. These are default resources with inside Kubernetes. You can do kubectl get network policy. In this example here, we're saying take the pod that uh, has a label tier backend and allow it to be able to egress to other pods that also have the tier backend. Right? So we're going to allow all the backend services within the default namespace to be able to talk to each other. We could also switch this to ingress, and we can have the opposite. Right? And this just allows us to start to configure and choose what pods are able to access other pods. Labels are going to become extremely important. Right? I'm going to talk about labels at the end, but it, it underpins almost everything you're going to do with inside Kubernetes. If you don't have a good labeling taxonomy, this whole thing becomes very messy. On the right-hand side, we have an Istio configuration, which essentially says, I want you to find all of our pods that currently have the label app shoes and has the service account inventory SA. Right? So if you remember before, we were talking about the default service account and how I got way too much access. Istio allows us to be able to specify the exact service account that it should be using. And I'm going to allow it to do post. By default, all the rest of the HTV verbs uh, get denied. So these are just two possible options. If you install Istio, you do have like 100,000 lines of YAML that you have to deal with. So just bear that in mind. I would start with the one on the left and then gradually make your way to the one on the right. Secret management failures is, is number eight. Ooh. So what's the problem? Well, let's take an example of where we have a compromised web application. And we know, and we just talked about, how service accounts get you know, mounted inside of, inside of your Kubernetes pods to allow the pod to be able to talk to the Kubernetes API. They all get mounted at the same directory. So I, I, I get inside of one of your pods. I do an ls here. I now have the service account token. Once I have the service account token, I know that I have some permissions to the Kubernetes API. I don't know what they are, but I know that I have some. Then, because I don't have a very locked down uh, operating system, I decide to install kubectl, because why not? I want to make my life easier. I don't want to be writing curl requests. And I start to you know, kubectl less secrets, or kubectl describe secret, or even worse than that, kubectl run pod, or kubectl run deployment. If I can get inside of your, uh, your application that's currently got a service account uh, token mounted, it puts me in a, in a better position to be able to start to run workloads that shouldn't be running inside your Kubernetes cluster. Now, if we go back to me talking about labeling taxonomy and how I said it's really important, if you've got 1,000 workloads currently running in your Kubernetes cluster, how are you going to find mine? If I make it just slightly different from one of your applications that are currently running, you probably never see it. Right? But now, if I have certain policies that won't allow me to be able to create pods if they don't match some kind of labeling taxonomy, I'm never going to be able to create it. And what will you get? You'll get audit logs that tell you that I'm trying to create a workload that doesn't meet your specification. Right? And now you know where it's coming from, what the, person, what the service account is currently trying to do. So what can we do, and how can we make this better? So we can encrypt secrets at rest, both inside of Kubernetes and outside of Kubernetes. So hands up if you're, uh, you're applying your Kubernetes secrets from some kind of centralized build system like Jenkins. No? Nope. Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, I'm glad there's less hands down than up in that instance. Um, but we need to make sure they're encrypted both wherever they're being stored before they enter Kubernetes, and also when they get to Kubernetes as well. We just talked about it then, the reason why we should ensure logging and auditing is in place, because in the instance where I do get inside, I need to be able to understand what's going on. 
and then also start to think about leveraging run, uh, runtime detection, right? If certain you know, services inside of your uh, Kubernetes cluster are performing an LS on that very specific directory, that is extremely suspicious, right? And you have the ability to be able to write rules that can detect that from happening. So everybody makes mistakes, right? You could mount a service account token inside of your pod by complete accident. And then someone comes in there, LS is the token uh, your, uh, location. And we have a nice rule that posts a message to Slack or PagerDuty or wherever you want it saying somebody is doing something that they shouldn't be doing. What you can do with inside Kubernetes is when you configure your deployments, you can set the auto mount service account token to off, right? It's like this hidden feature because there's hundreds of possible options and that one's not very well uh, talked about. That by default stops the default service account from getting mounted inside your pod. Nine times out of 10, you do not need a service account inside your application. Your API doesn't need your actual API or your microservice does not need access to the Kubernetes API. So by default, set that thing to off. Right? And then even if by accident you create a service account token, it's not going to get added. So some useful tools with regards to secrets. You can use Mozilla SOPs. It's a tool by Mozilla that allows you to be able to uh, encrypt your secrets using a number of different uh, tools and technologies, such as KMS, GPG, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can use sealed secrets there, which allows you to uh, encrypt your Kubernetes secrets as plain YAML with your public key, have a controller that's sitting inside of your Kubernetes cluster with your private key, the private key decrypts, et cetera, et cetera, you get the Kubernetes cluster. And then the final one there is, is Vault, which allows you to be able to inject from Vault directly into your Kubernetes cluster, uh, into your application or your pod. So you don't have this kind of concept of secrets just floating around in your Kubernetes ecosystem that you have to try and figure out. So now we get onto some, some bad ones, right? So now we've kind of worked out that our own ecosystem and our Kubernetes configuration is insecure. Now we're starting to get to the bits which are a bit more worrying. So what, uh, what parts or components that make up your Kubernetes cluster could potentially be misconfigured? So there are a number of different components in the Kubernetes cluster. This, this is more for the managed Kubernetes cluster than it, uh, sorry, for the uh, self-managed Kubernetes cluster or the DIY clusters than it is for your managed Kubernetes clusters. So there are a number of components, and like anything in Kubernetes, there's also hundreds of flags that you can configure on each of these components. Um, and no one's going to remember every single flag, and nor they're going to remember the correct configuration to set for every single flag. However, one of the most important components in the Kubernetes cluster is the kubelet. Hands up if you know what the kubelet does. So the kubelet's job is to interact with um, the container runtime, so Docker, for example, um, and create containers, delete containers, pull your images from your registries, uh, but it also acts as an agent that talks back to the Kubernetes API. So guess what? If you configure this wrong, and I, get, I, I can start to do you know, bad things in that instance. So as an example, one of the things that you can do with a kubelet configuration is you can set anonymous auth to true. Right? That's not good. You don't want to be doing that. Uh, if you do that, I can, you know, the kubelet is talking to the API you know, unauthenticated. Luckily enough, if you're running you know, your own DIY clusters, you can use tools such as kubebench. And what this does is it runs the CIS benchmark against your Kubernetes cluster and tells you how bad the overall configuration is. You can run this as a one-off job. You can run it constantly every week. You can run it every month, how, you know, whatever cadence you want. They have the YAML description in this repository for managed Kubernetes clusters as well. right? So, just because you're using managed Kubernetes clusters does not necessarily mean they're secure. They're probably more secure than, uh, than we would configure out the box, but it's just something to, uh, to think about. It's, it, it's an interesting uh, exercise to run the CIS benchmarks against your managed Kubernetes cluster right, and see the results. For example, EKS in, uh, in Amazon does not come back completely clean. There are some warnings there. Um, 
I haven't tested uh, GKE in Google or, or AKS in, uh, in Azure. So we have components in, that make up the Kubernetes cluster that can be insecure, vulnerable, misconfigured, right? But there's also like this outdated element. So hands up, who knows how many times Kubernetes release every year? OK, what number? Four, yep, correct. So it's four releases, one every quarter. Next question, how many versions does Kubernetes tell you that you can be behind? If your API, if your kind of control plane, which is the main uh, interface with the Kubernetes cluster, is at a higher version than the nodes that are currently running at your, your workloads. So what's the skew? One, two, three, or four? Any guesses? So the answer is two. So that means, and they, 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 don't, they also don't do long-term support, right? So they just, if there's a problem, they just go upgrade your Kubernetes cluster like everyone, you know, it just, it's just a five-minute job. Um, so one of the things that's really important is to, try, is to have an upgrade process within your organization, right? Don't sit on 121 when we're currently on 126, right? That's quite a large gap. There's a number of CVEs that have been fixed there. The other thing they do is they deprecate API versions. So you could be, if you remember before I was showing the, the deployment of apps v1, between like 121 and 122 as an example, they deprecated six APIs. So, or they um, completely removed them. So things that used to work no longer work, right? Including all your RBAC configuration. So you say, you create a nice policy that says Steve can access uh, this ingress resource that has the API version extensions v1, and then they decide that th that's no longer going to be supported, and it's now network v1. Well, guess what? All of your application developers come piling into your room and say, what on earth is going on? I've lost all my access, right? And the larger you leave that gap, the more headache it's going to be to upgrade. So try and get in this process of upgrading your Kubernetes cluster on a regular cadence, including managed Kubernetes as well. Unfortunately, Kubernetes itself isn't secure. Neither are a bunch of workloads that you probably run on your Kubernetes cluster, right? Prime example, recently, Argo CD with their first uh, zero-day CVE. You can see over there as well that Kubernetes also has a number of CVEs. We don't just have to upgrade our Kubernetes cluster. We have to have a process of upgrading the workloads that currently run in our Kubernetes cluster, not just your apps, right? If you've got things like Prometheus or Grafana for a for observability, or you've got kind of Fluent Bit or Fluent D that's being used to ship all of your, uh, your logs to your centralized logging system. These things need upgrading, right? They need caring. You know, there's a, there's a lot to deal with just with this alone, right? Because there's so there could be potentially so many applications that you're currently running within your Kubernetes cluster that no product team manages. And then there's this awful like, oh, well, whose problem is it to upgrade? So, some questions to ask yourself. From an image perspective, which is like the lowest level that we can possibly go with problems, are you using hard, hardened base images? Well, people are using Ubuntu and Debian, so maybe that's something that you go back to your organization and think about, how do we get off of those? How do we move to something that's smaller? Are they running as root, potentially? Are you leveraging consistent users and groups within uh, within your applications, your applications that you currently run and you're responsible for, right? More consistency, the consistency that we have across the board, the easier it is to put some of these configurations into place. Do you have a labeling taxonomy, right? Does the whole organization have a labeling taxonomy that makes like logging, alerting, writing policies, writing rules? Does it make it easy? Like imagine you've got a number of engineers that run, work across four or five product teams and they all use different labels, well, all of your network policies are going to look completely different, right? There's no consistency there. It makes it very difficult. Then we talked about admission control. Are, we le are you leveraging or creating any policies to stop bad workloads from entering your Kubernetes cluster? Yes, you could go back to your organization. You could do a review of the current cluster, but that current cluster that you've just reviewed is going to probably be completely different to when you started reviewing it. Right? We need to stop things from entering the Kubernetes cluster and build up some standards. 
I've said the same thing, Jimmy said the same thing this morning. Are we auditing the RBAC configuration or are we, just, are we allowing a bunch of people to have these five-star reviews that I keep going on about? So go back to your, uh, your organization, go to your Kubernetes cluster, start looking for things with stars. Stars are not great, right? They're, they're not great everywhere, um, but especially in your RBAC configuration. And then finally, do you have processes for regularly upgrading Kubernetes and also your third-party tools? That's extremely important. The longer you lag behind there, you know, the more difficult the upgrade path is going to be. And uh, that's all for me. I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, so it's actually interesting you ask that. At the workshop that we put on uh, yesterday and, and Monday, that question got brought up. So for those of you who are not familiar with GVisor, GVisor kind of sits in between your, uh, your workload or your pod and the underlying kernel and can block and allow you know, system calls to happen at that level. So the number of system calls that you get in GVisor by default is a, is a heck of a lot smaller than the ones you get in the underlying kernel, for sure. Um, and you know, there's this nice isolation boundary that you've got there. However, there's an overhead because everything is going through GVisor before it really makes its way to the kernel. So in, at large scale, that could become pretty disruptive. But I think for small scale, it's a great starting place for sure, right? It makes it, it even if you do allow uh, privilege escalation, if you have something that's sat you know, between your workload and the kernel that's blocking potentially a large number of syscalls that you can make, I think that's a win. I personally haven't used it, um, but it looks pretty interesting. Is there a tool that you use to help scan your YAML to specify some of the instances or opportunities uh, for vulnerabilities? Yeah, so I, I talk about, when I, when I talk to customers, I talk, you've got pre-deployment, at deployment, and post-deployment, right? What we've talked about is we've kind of talked about, you know, during deployment with our uh, admission control. But the language that you use to write admission control normally is going to be Rego, right? And there are tools that allow you to be able to run Rego in CI. So if, if your YAML configuration or the resources that you currently define to be deployed to Kubernetes are stored in Git, you can run tools such as ConfTest, right? A prime example. ConfTest is a way for, for you to be able to run Rego against your Kubernetes, class, uh, against your Kubernetes manifests pre-deployment. There are also other tools such as Cube Eval, so K U B E V A L, which makes sure that you match up against the schema, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you've configured it successfully, but from a from a security standpoint, but validates that the YAML that you currently have uh, in your in your Git repository matches the schema that you're currently going to be deployed to. Was that, your, was that your question with regards to YAML? Or do you, like, there's also ones that you can do with images as well, right? So there's Trivi or Gripe or, you know, there's, there's a number of other tools that, you know, allow you to be, able to, to be able to do that. But I think the important thing to do is choose a tool that allows you to do pre and during, right? If you have a different tool for pre and then another one for doing, like during the, uh, the API request inside your Kubernetes cluster, you get disparity and a kind of false sense of security when you're doing CI. And then by the time you hit the Kubernetes cluster, they, you just reject all your deployments. So what you think was going to work, it doesn't actually work. And that's even more annoying to you know, an engineer or a developer. Any other questions? Jimmy? <laughs> you can join the GitHub repository, add issues, commit back uh, upstream, add PRs. You know, there are, there are 10 points on the OWASP top 10. You know, as a prime example, when, when it was written, the, the issue that I showed where you could list secrets via curl, that was actually a contribution to the upstream OWASP top 10. That wasn't something that we created. Someone actually committed that back as a pull request. So yeah, join in on github.com slash OWASP plus project Kubernetes top 10. Another one. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so there's actually a repository called, uh, or a URL called securekubernetes.com, which is essentially a CTF that you know, shows how if you don't configure some of this stuff successfully, you, uh, you can do bad things. So we actually went through that in the training uh, the last couple of days. It will ruin your Kubernetes cluster. So, like, create a brand new Kubernetes cluster and then deploy it. Don't go and deploy that to one in your organization because it's not a good look. Okay, if that's all, I'll be uh, around for the rest of the day. I'm happy to field questions. Thanks so much.